you know, every now and then a broadcaster needs help, and sometimes from his guest. My guest is Dr. Alfred, and here is the help I need from him. First of all, welcome. There you go. It's good to be here. Uh, the first uh, advice uh, I got when I was a young journalist was from the Canadian Press style book that said, if you're going to interview someone whose name is Smith, you better ask them how to pronounce it, because the time you don't, it'll be Smythe or Smithy. So I need two things from you. How do you pronounce your first name, and how do you pronounce the title of your book? Well, my first name is Tayayage, and it's a, a Mohawk name, Tayayage. And uh, the title of my book from 2005 is Wasaze. And what does that word mean? Wasaze is a word that was inherited uh, by the Haudenosaunee people from other uh, indigenous nations, more in the Midwest and the southern Midwestern part of what's now the United States. And it's uh, a ceremonial dance and uh, a song um, that, was, that was gifted to us and has become part of Haudenosaunee or Iroquois uh, cultures since then. And it refers to this kind of a dance that was originally a war dance, um, kind of like a gathering of power. And I assume originally people speaking about their exploits in war and telling a story basically of, of the adventure that they'd been on. Whereas now it's part of the uh, ceremonial culture in the Haudenosaunee and it precedes uh, like a smoke dance, which is more of a social dance but uh, it's, it's something that's kind of like a, a holdover from a previous era uh, in, our, in our dance and song culture. But it is also a ceremony um, and a ritual in our people's culture as well. And so uh, I used it as the title for my book because of the spirit of, uh, of that word and of, of the things that I just spoke about and a gathering of unity and a restoration of power because that book is all about the concept of a, of a resurgence of indigenous people. Yeah, I took um, from some of your writings uh, the notion that it is time to uh, get together, uh, assemble the power, um, be aware of uh, history and culture and, and all of what those kinds of things mean. Am I on the right track there? Yeah, that's definitely the spirit I brought to it. I mean, I had written in the past um, about basic understanding of what indigenous nationhood is. You know, our concepts of, of nationhood are different than, say, Quebecois or European concepts, especially as they're conveyed in academic literature. Um, and then I'd written about leadership, the, the nature of what indigenous leadership is as opposed to other forms of leadership or other ideas of the ethics and practice of leadership. And this book was really about um, movements and how do we get people moving and how do we get people to um, take action on the principles that we espouse. And so I, I like, like my previous book, the other one was called Peace, Power, Righteousness. And I used a, a traditional Haudenosaunee ceremony pertaining to leadership as the framework for that book to think through it, but and also to organize it. And in this book, I did the same kind of thing I looked at uh, the, the teachings and the ideas and the, the principles embedded in our ceremonial culture and languages to try to have an idea about movement that resonated with indigenous culture and, of course, was effective and had, had a chance of being effective in confronting the colonial realities that uh, define our lives. Now, I'm probably just guessing, but I'm probably uh, reasonably far away from you culturally, but I grew up in part pretty close to you geographically in Saint Laurent, Cartierville, Mansonville, Shefferville, places in Quebec, and you're from Ganawaki. Mm -hmm. um, however, an Ivy League school like Cornell is a long way away from where we grew up. Uh, tell me about your personal path to get there. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Uh... Sometimes I think to myself, how did I end up there? <laughs> because um, I grew up in Ganawage and I lived there um, almost all of my life, aside from stint in the United States Marine Corps, um, and up until I was about 32. And so growing up in Ganawage, it's, it's a, we're fortunate in Ganawage, even at that time, even in the 80s, there, there was a high level of education relatively 
and uh, being close to the city, Montreal, and I think by the, the nature of our culture in Ganawage, people are very take charge uh, type of people and they take advantage of opportunities. They're very pragmatic minded as well. And so education has always re been recognized for the value that it has at that time. And so I was always channeled into higher education. Um, I went to Loyola High School in Montreal and uh, a very good school um, in terms of laying a foundation of uh, critical thinking and writing and all the basics, you know. Um, my journey well, to... Well, if I may interrupt, I went to Lower Canada College, so I won't get into a debate with you about the merits of uh, a Jesuit education. I will, I will just acknowledge that it does have benefits. <laughs> Okay, I guess we can uh, we can discuss that at another time. <laughs> I might agree with you on some of the on some of the points you make, though. <laughs> the uh, the the journey for me though wasn't straight. You know, I uh, I did finish. I graduated from Loyola, and then uh, I I decided to take another path. I wasn't I wasn't really the strongest student in high school. And uh, I wasn't really interested in going to school. I, I enrolled at Marianapolis College in Montreal, which you will know, or anybody watching this from Montreal will know. And I only lasted one semester because I think I had chosen the wrong field. My family owned a, a restaurant, and uh, I kind of grew up in a restaurant. And I thought at the time, well, I'm going to go to college. I'll, I'll take business, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll figure out how to, how to run the restaurant and take that over, that kind of thing. Um, it didn't work out because I'm horrible at math. I, I failed calculus. Uh, it, it was just, it was just a nightmare experience sitting in those classes in, in a commerce program. <laughs> and so, uh, I was disillusioned about school and, uh, I had always had a more creative streak, you know, I was into writing and reading and poetry and all that stuff. But at the time I didn't really feel like it could be channeled into anything productive. Remember the pragmatic streak in Mohawks, right? So uh, I, I just kind of got disillusioned with education and I ended up joining the United States Marines. So I went and I did that from the time I was 18 to 21. And uh, so that's just a whole other story. But we're talking about education here. And by the time, by the time I was done with the Marine Corps, um, I, was ready, I was ready to go back to school. And well, it seems to me that uh, being in the Marine Corps is an education whether you like it or not. Um, this was after the Vietnam War, I assume. Did you serve overseas? It, it was it was just after the Vietnam War. Yeah, I joined in 1980 and actually I signed up in '81, but I ended up going in '82. And uh, it was definitely a post-Vietnam hangover uh, in the military in the United States at that time. And it was a bit of a mess when I joined, um, but I did end up going overseas. There were no it, was, it wasn't the era that we're in now with the kind of wars that we have now. I don't know if people can remember back in the 80s, there was a lot of covert and a Cold War type things going on. And uh, yeah, I ended up going overseas. I was in, in Korea and Japan and Okinawa and uh, in the Caribbean too and Honduras, places like that. So those are all the kind of things that were going on at that time. And so... Um, it was a different type of ed of education for me. I mean, coming of age in the Marine Corps as as a man, you know, um, pretty much defines you for many many years afterwards in terms of the standards that you have and the ideas that you have, particularly in terms of leadership and physicality and so forth. And I was, I mean, I was right in there. I was in the infantry. Uh, I was a machine gunner in the infantry, and I was the squad leader in an infantry platoon in the United States Marine. So that pretty much tells you <laughs> the, the foundation of my idea of, uh, of masculinity, you know? But, and, and, and let me ask you why you didn't join the Canadian military because you had uh, J2, F2, I think, and the Van Dues and the Princess Patricia's Light Infantry, uh, Airborne. You know, you had a lot of options in Canada. Why the U.S. Marine Corps? Well, this was 1982, and the Canadian Army couldn't hold a candle to the United States military at that time. Still can't, but it's much, much more so then. You know, there was just no comparison. You know, if you wanted to travel and if you wanted to, to do anything exciting in 1981, 
or 82, the, the Canadian Army wasn't an option. I mean, if, if you could join the U.S. military, you did. And uh, the, the couple of things you mentioned there just didn't exist, like the JTF didn't exist. Um, and so uh, the U.S. Marines are, they are the standard as far as uh, adventures in military <laughs> lifestyle. And so uh, being Mohawk and being Indigenous, we're afforded the opportunity to join those legally. And so we did. The other, the other point is that, you know, the Canadian Army is our occupying force. So there's a bit of, uh, you know, there's a bit of rationalization that has to go on among our people to go join the U.S. military. It's just that the U.S. military is not the one that, that we contend with. So there's no chance of the U.S. military coming to invade Ganawage. So people are quite happy to go and serve in that as, with a kind of mercenary mind? Well, all right, we're not at Cornell yet. How did you get to Cornell? Uh, I, I, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I, I went to Concordia University uh, in history, and I did my history degree, in it, and that's when kind of my educational uh, journey took a turn because it did very well and um, came out right at the top of my class. And uh, my professors at the time recommended that I go to grad school. I didn't even know, given my family background and lack of general experience in education circles beyond my own personal experience, I didn't even know what grad school was really. I had to research it and find out that that was the pathway that took you to professorship and being a professor in a whole academic realm. And um, it took a little bit of convincing, but once I found out that it was an option, I thought I, I, thought I could try it. You know, if I could make if I could make a life reading and writing and speaking and influencing people, I saw how that could be melded with by what that at that point became something I was very interested in, which was advancing the cause of our people through politics. So uh, I applied to a bunch of schools. So I applied to some Canadian schools, uh, a couple of American schools, and luckily. With my grades and background and interests, I, I got accepted at Cornell, and that's where I ended up going. And I mean, it, it is a top school in in the world, but it's also only four and a half hours from Ganawage. so it was sort of like a double whammy. It's like, oh, you can get into top school in the world, and you can still be relatively close to home. And so, in the end, I chose that one. Now, I'm just guessing you were an interesting person at Cornell, not only because you were uh, from the country north of America, uh, but also from uh, Ganawaki and an indigenous person. How did that work for you? What was socializing like? Uh, it, it was good. I mean, at, at a place like Cornell, there's, a, there's people from all backgrounds and all different experiences and stuff. And so I really enjoyed my time over there. It was very difficult intellectually. It was hard work. Um, very taxing psychologically as well. I think things have changed in academia. Well, I know things have changed in academia in uh, in 30 something years, but at the time it was still the old school, you know, um, very, very familiar actually in a certain way, you know, coming from the Jesuit experience and then coming from the Marine Corps uh, to go into this elite liberal school where the boot camp was much more of an intellectual boot camp as opposed to a physical. Uh, or psychological one, uh, I, I, I could deal with it. And, well, and it, you know, it, it, interesting, uh, it, it's hard to tell which would be tougher, the Jesuits or the Marines, but uh, only you, you can tell. Um, let me skip ahead to some of the books you've written, because I said at the beginning of this interview that I needed your help, and you have helped me in another way. Each title of your book essentially is an excellent question. And one of your books is Heeding the Voices of Our Ancestors. So this is a cultural thing that uh, I need to understand because I don't know who all my ancestors were. You know, my father was interested in genealogy but didn't hand down a great deal. Uh, talk about the importance of ancestors, if you would. Yeah, I mean, that title refers to, I mean, it's, it's lifted from a, a quote that I use as an epigram in, to begin it. You know, um, it's something where at the time that I wrote it, coming out of this colonial era and, and sort of right at the, the first phase of this reassertion of 
of our identity and our existence, really, coming out of uh, many, many years of uh, attempted suppression of, of who we are as Indigenous peoples in Canada and North America. Um, where do you draw your inspiration from in terms of your identity and your culture? And, and we, we were coming out of an era where we were told that the way you were, the way your people were, was wrong. Uh, you need to change. You need to let that go. And you need to embrace our ideas, our culture, our beliefs, our ancestors, essentially. So we needed, we needed to embrace Shakespeare. We needed to embrace the Bible. We needed to embrace uh, Milton. We needed to embrace all the people from Europe who were at the foundation of Western society. And people like me and my generation coming up saying, no, uh, what you Native people need to do, what we Native people need to do, is reconnect to your ancestors and that ancestral vision of who you are and reject, in fact, the colonial vision and reject the Western idea of what it is to be a Indian at the time uh, or a First Nations person or Aboriginal person, now Indigenous person, to reject that and put the work into learning who you are in the vision of your ancestors. And so listening for those voices in their songs, in their languages, in the ceremonies, reading books with an eye, with a critical eye, to finding what we could that was true about us from our ancestors' perspective. And so that's where that title came from, and that's what I meant by ancestors. And it's not direct lineal uh, descent that I'm referring to, and when Native people talk about ancestors, they're not necessarily referring to it in a genealogical sense. Although uh, I am quite happy, uh, just in a personal sense, that. Uh, uh, a really, you know, renowned scholar among our people, Paul Williams, who does historical research, is a legal scholar, um, sent me an email just uh, the other day to remind me that the person with the name Tayayage uh, was actually someone involved in defending our land and was a war chief and was involved in all of these different wars, and it's in the colonial record. So I have a direct lineal descent which makes me happy, but that's not actually uh, what I'm talking about when I talk about ancestors. It's, it's the previous generations of our people and trying to live consistently with the way that they saw the world and uh, the ethics and the principles that they lived by. Now, here's another uh, title of your book, and it, uh, it writes its own question, Peace, Power, Righteousness, and Indigenous Manifesto. Uh, Manifesto is associated, of course, with... Uh, revolutionaries, Karl Marx, uh, what have you. Uh, so speak about that a bit. Yeah, the title of that one, um, I'll, I'll do the subtitle first, because in, in terms of a manifesto, um, conscious, of course, of what a manifesto is and what the intent of a manifesto is. So definitely written with the eye towards laying out a program of action that people can follow um, or take inspiration from in in building a movement for change in their community and it's a nod to uh one of the, one of my heroes who is a very prominent indigenous scholar a dakota scholar um at the time vine deloria jr and um he was an activist and a scholar and his most well-known book um custard died for your sins an indian manifesto uh, and so I, I just felt like, well, that book was so influential to me and influential in his time. It's a nod in, of respect, but also maybe uh, rubbing a stone for good luck to, to kind of take the same subtitle, but change it to an indigenous manifesto. And, you know, I, I had a chance to talk to him about that, and he was pretty happy that, that I had done that. Uh, and so the main title, Peace, Power, Righteousness, refers to um, in, in Mohawk, the three central concepts of, of our philosophical teachings. And so when we talk about wampum, when we talk about our ceremonies, when we talk about the, the language and, and so forth about, if you had to boil it down to the central teachings of what it is to be heard in Nashoni, you, you would have these three concepts resonating almost through everything, skana, peace, kasistasara, power, and garihuyo you know, um, righteousness or the good way. And 
that is that is the reason that I chose that is to kind of like have that resonate through the whole book, those three concepts, but also take people on a journey in the book. Is it's a fairly short book, but and it's kind of like an extended essay, but it's to take them from where we are now, which is this kind of like discordant reality, just recovering from colonialism and the, the scattering of our minds in colonialism and trying to bring them to a place where they have the ability to see clearly what peace, power, and righteousness mean in terms of Haudenosaunee teachings so that they can then take this book as a manifesto and start implementing it in their own lives, in their own families, in their own communities. So that's, that's where that title comes from. Now, um, have I got the pronunciation right, Wasase? Mm-hmm. Okay. In that book, about three quarters of the way through, there is a statement that really caught my eye and my imagination and made me want to speak with you. And it was something along these lines. When you look at an unemployed person who works in the fishing industry or the logging industry or some other resource sector, and they are really suffering because of globalization, and they're suffering more now because of the pandemic, that they should feel some sort of solidarity with the people you call Indians, and you say, I guess we're all Indians now, suffering from uh, globalization. I thought that was a really powerful uh, bridge, because often people who are activists, they don't want to build a bridge to other people, they want to cut bridges down, or build an island, or build a moat or something. So could you talk about that quote? Yeah. Um well, when I wrote that, it was a bit of a different reality than the one we're, we're, we're operating in now in terms of the relationship between non-Indigenous movements and Indigenous movements. So back then, um, which is like 15 years ago now, uh, or 16 or 17 when I wrote it, um, the, the idea of a very close working relationship between, say, environmental movements or social justice movements and Indigenous movements, Indigenous rights movements, was just a dream. Um, I can remember speaking about that in many speeches, talking about wouldn't it be great if we could have this kind of coming together of minds where uh, people who are environmental activists in Canada could let go of their colonial ideas in regard to race and so forth and really see the power in unifying the collective, collective action potential of a broad-based environmental movement with the rootedness and the knowledge and the vision of indigenous philosophies. You know, we talk about that a lot at the time, but it's actually kind of, it's come to pass and it's, and it's happened. And so it's a bit of a different reality. So when I wrote that, it was kind of um, um, a poke at people who were in objective terms feeling the effects of capitalist suppression of themselves of being manipulated by ownership classes and the elites in society and suffering for it but not being able to see the the complementarity in organizing in conjunction with indigenous movements to make systemic change which was affecting negatively indigenous peoples and workers in Canada. And so it's kind of a poke at their own racism to say you're blinded by, by racism because if you weren't racist, you would see that it's not the native person who is taking away your job. It's the ownership class who's manipulating both of these in order to continue to benefit from indigenous people's dispossession and the unjust terms of your labor. So, I mean, this is a Marxist kind of analysis, but it's absolutely true in this sense here where colonialism evolved into capitalism and people who are not part of the elite stratas of that society don't benefit from it. And we're all subject to it. And, uh, you know, when it goes bad, it goes really bad for everyone. And so to try to change it in a way that alters it systemically and not just you know incidentally is is one of the goals i think of of all movements in canada that have any hope of doing good for mass numbers of people 
Well, I, I suspect that everybody from Marx to uh, John Kenneth Galbraith and everybody in between, left, right, center, would say we're in a heck of a mess uh, for sure. Why uh, or how to get out of it would be another matter. But let me um, uh, ask uh, this of you. Um, the example that I often use about, about the Indian Act is that if America came into Canada and lobbied our Senate to get a resolution passed and then said, there you are, we got what we want and you folks should obey this, we would have to push back and say, well, that's not how our governmental system works. The Senate isn't the place for that kind of legislation. Or if the UN or some other international body came in and said to me, oh, hey, uh, Alan, we've been looking at your file and we've decided you're not actually Canadian, so you don't get uh, your pension or your benefits or your health care or what have you. And this is essentially what the Indian Act does to Indigenous peoples, decides uh, who they are, if they are, uh, imposes a ban council on them. And this is why we're in this, or one of the reasons we're in this kind of mess about um, territory and about pipelines and about all kinds of things. So the other activist phrase is, what is to be done? You know, what can be done in this very complex situation where the Indian Act gives the minister more power over Indigenous people than anybody except for federal prisoners? Mm -hmm. the, you want to know the what is to be done part? That's exactly what I want, because I'm not in a position to say what it should be, but I want to know, is there something that can be done? I, I believe there is something to be done, and there's, there's, there are changes um happening at the at the the foundational level which is where things need to happen in my view in terms of indigenous people's view of themselves um their spirituality their cultural practices and so forth basically their their definition of who they are needs to be reconceived from the one that was embodied in the indian act which is a subject of colonial control to, to be managed as a problem to benefit the people who came here and stole our land. So an Indian in Canada is defined in the Indian Act uh, in legal terms. There's a, there's a whole political and social cultural structure built around the Indian Act that enforces that idea of what it is to be an Indian, but it is really nothing more than a problem being managed. Um, to break out of that cage and to reimagine ourselves in the fullest extent in the vision of our ancestors and to delegitimize the idea of the Indian that was foisted on us by the Indian Act, I think is the central act of resistance. And so to, to, to kind of draw back in everything that was taken away from us and, and generation after generation re-enliven ourselves as Ungwehunwe, as, as real native people, um, the Indian Act won't contain that. It can't contain that. And all of the struggles that you see now, political, legal, social, cultural struggles, are reflections of that contest between this resurging indigenous identity and the incapable vessel. And so it's cracking, it's breaking. And of course, the the government, federal and provincial governments, um, want to keep the Indian Act in its essence because it is the only thing that serves as the legal basis for their continued exploitation of indigenous peoples through the alienation of them from ownership of their land. And so, and without the Indian Act, what do you have? You have matriarchal systems of government that are directly democratic rooted in a certain place and that is that is not uh harmonizing with the ideas that canadian society and the in the major institutions and the economy of canadian society have for the use of that land and yet the efforts to uh turn indigenous land into a corporation or fee simple ownership and apparently give control the indigenous people that's a bit of a trick too isn't it in my view it is and i think that increasingly it's 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 seen to be by by more and more people not only indigenous people but non-indigenous people who have a critical perspective on on 
on the capitalism as well. Um, the problem here is that over generations of colonialism, with imposition of Christianity and deculture, deculturation through residential and Indian day schools and so forth, you have many indigenous people who don't know their own culture. Number one, so that's one project there, a long-term education project and a revitalization re of cultural project. But worse than that, you have a lot of indigenous people who are identified um, by the government in terms of being champions of the colonial project and or who kind of follow in, fall into it in the normal course of, of professional life uh, in this colonial reality. Because even though that vessel is cracking, it's still the central fact of our existence and so basically what i'm saying is you have a lot of educated intelligent indigenous people who are heavily invested in the colonial structure and so you have that to contend with as well and so you're not only as a as a person struggling uh to move indigenous peoples uh towards a a, a reality that reflects their ancestral vision you have people within your own community who are invested in the colonial vision. And so it's not only fighting against white society, so to speak, um, although it's a huge generalization, um, you're also fighting against co-opted members of your own nation. Well, and then people of goodwill on all sides will say, you know, uh, land ownership is a good idea versus land ownership means it can be sold and one or two generations down the line, there is no indigenous land left. So I wonder if this is the right punctuation mark. I don't think we've solved any problems here today, Dr. Alfred, but I do think that we have at least articulated them. Uh, what, if anything, have I failed to ask you that you want to talk about? <laughs> um, I don't think you've failed at anything. This is a conversation that I've been having for almost 40 years now. And uh, I mean, I, I think that we can probably talk for years um about this and still not get at all of the different facets of this issue the heart of the problem i think is something that we've really we've done a good job at getting at uh in the questions that you've asked me in the conversation we've had which is that it really is all about the land and people's people's ideas about our our place our presence and our ethical use of the land and how we treat each other coming out of that central idea really shapes the, the society that we live in. And so indigenous peoples had one idea about human beings' relationship to the natural environment and the land. European societies, by the time they arrived here, and as it evolved, have a different one. And that's the central contest that we're dealing with. And, and we've been dealing with it for 500 years, and uh, we'll probably be dealing with it for the next while too, until the world really comes to grips with the fact that that idea that emerged out of Europe is destructive and is not sustainable for human society on earth. Well, interesting start. And so are your books and uh, thank you for your time. And I wish you well. No, go Alan. Bye-bye.